Hey y'all, welcome back to another round of engineering, and we're going to just continue on with analysis techniques. To remind you where we were, we've previously discussed node voltage method. And in particular, if we wanted to kind of encapsulate that entire process, it's applying KCL combined with Ohm's law to break the process of solving a circuit down into two pieces. And namely, we identify the potentials of various nodes in the circuit. And then after we've identified and found the value of the voltages for each of those nodes, then we turn around and apply Ohm's law to get the current through each of the individual branches. Now we are going to introduce a second analysis technique called mesh current. And as you probably can guess at this point, it is going to use again Ohm's law, but now instead of KCL, it's going to use KVL. As one would expect, what we do is we use Ohm's law and the voltage to find the current in individual meshes. And then we'll use the difference in currents along a given branch to find the total current. So that's the 30,000 foot overview. To give you an idea about the process, okay? so I'll, I'll give you the steps and then we'll practice using those steps in a particular circuit. The first step is just drawing your circuit. Okay? And, okay, so step zero, draw circuit. Draw circuit. And here is something that I've kind of, the book mentions, and I should really emphasize here, is that it has to be a planar circuit. Okay. What that means is that you can redraw the circuit so that um, uh, wires don't overlap, don't cross. Okay? The reason for that is that it, it's not that the mesh current doesn't work on non-planar circuits, it's just it's really hard to identify the meshes. Okay? If you're thinking about a three-dimensional circuit, if you will, if you can't put it flat on a piece of paper, then it gets a little harder to envision where the meshes are. So it's not that you can't do it, it's that you lose the advantage of time efficiency. So then uh, what we're going to do after that is that you need to ID the meshes. And remember, a mesh is the smallest possible loop in a circuit. So a loop that does not contain any other loops. After that... Now here's where the magic happens, okay? On your diagram, label the direction of a current in each of the meshes. And I'll be more specific here. Choose either clockwise or counterclockwise currents. And I'll say for all meshes. Okay. Then what we're going to do is we are going to walk around each individual mesh and apply KVL. Okay. So finding the voltage drops across each individual mesh, walking in the direction that you have chosen for the currents. Okay. And then finally, we'll solve the system of equations that arises. Okay. EQN. And in particular, what we'll be solving for in this case is not the voltages of the nodes. And that, that's the other. What we are going to solve here are what are the individual currents within the meshes. So when we're solving the system of equations, we're going to be solving for currents. Okay. Now, the last step in this would be 
if there is a branch that is shared between two adjacent meshes, how we find the resulting current in that branch is that we will take the difference of the two mesh currents that we find. I'll say that again. If there is a branch shared by two adjacent meshes, how we find the current in that branch is by taking the difference of the two mesh currents. Okay? Good. So let's get an example. We'll, I've, I've given you kind of the algorithmic process. Let's get an example. And we'll go back to our favorite circuit. We already know the answer to this circuit. Now we're just going to do mesh current to find it. So the first thing is, is that we need to ensure that the, the circuit is, in a, is drawn as a planar circuit. In other words, anytime we see two lines, two wires meeting, it's actually a, an essential node. Okay. Incidentally, and I'm sorry, I haven't mentioned this before. Incidentally, if you ever have two wires that cross and you don't want it to actually be an electrical connection, okay? How you can indicate that on a diagram is that you draw a wire and then you, you, you have what's like a little loopy kind of thing. That's just to indicate that the two wires aren't actually connected. One wire crosses over another. In a planar circuit, you can redraw it so that the wires don't cross at all. So be careful there. Now, I, that being said, most of the time, I'm not going to, I'm not, I won't be giving you non-planar circuits, but it is possible for you to run into such circuits later on. Okay, so just be aware of that situation. Okay, well now I have my planar circuit. I need to identify the number of meshes. And so what we see is that we have a bottom mesh here and we have a top mesh here. So we have, okay, number of meshes, we have two. So the next step, we need to choose a direction for the mesh current. And again, be consistent, choose the mesh currents to go all in the same direction. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and I will choose my meshes. I'm gonna choose the current to be going counterclockwise. And I'll call this current I1. I'll call this current I2. And now hopefully you see, again, when we're talking about this middle branch, which I'll highlight here, the current in that middle branch will be the difference between I2, which is running to the left, and I1, which is running to the right. You can almost think of it as the current in that middle branch is the superposition of the two mesh currents. The reason I'm not going to use the term superposition in particular is because that's another analysis technique. There's a different analysis, analysis technique, which is called the, the um, superposition technique. So I'm going to try to avoid using that phrase here just to make sure that we don't get confused. Okay, so we have the number of meshes. Now we are going to go ahead and apply KVL to get our system of equations. So I'll start in the bottom left-hand corner here, and I'm going to walk around the bottom mesh applying KVL. Now, keep in mind, we will use the drops and jumps according to the direction of the mesh current. Okay. So starting in this bottom left-hand corner, I'm walking, I'm walking, I'm walking, and immediately I see a 5-volt drop. So I'll go ahead and say that I have a 5-volt drop. I will call the negative sign five, or negative signs for drops. I'll use positive signs for jumps. So I'll keep walking, I keep walking. I'm moving in the direction of I1, and so I hit a 3-ohm resistor. So thinking of Ohm's law, I should take the resistance times the current. Now convention is that since I am walking in the direction of I1, 
I have a drop according to I1, and then I have I2, the difference of the two mesh currents. Now I keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going around the circuit, and again I have another drop of 8 ohms times I1. And then I am back to where I started. Okay. Go ahead, take a second, see if you can write down the equation for the top mesh. Got it? All right. So here we go. I'm going to start in the, uh, what I've labeled as node A, and I'm going to again walk in the direction of I2. So doing that, I see that I have a drop of 10 volts, so I'll put a negative 10 here. I keep walking, I walk, I walk, I walk. I have a drop across the one ohm resistor, one, and I have I2. I keep walking, I walk, I walk, and now I hit that shared three ohm resistor again. Okay. Now I have a drop, so I have three ohms, and here, we have I2 minus I1. Remember, I'm considering I2 as being the direction that I'm walking along. So I1 is in the opposite direction of I2. So hence, I get that negative sign here. Keep walking, keep walking. I hit that 5 volt potential, which is now not a drop, but a jump. So I'm going to put a plus here. And that whole rigor morale equals zero. Now, as I promised, I said, hey, when we apply mesh currents, we'll get a system of equations. And those system, that system of equations can be used to solve for the mesh currents, the I's. And we indeed notice that here the only unknowns we have are the currents I1 and I2. So let's go ahead and get this equation into standard form. So I will use the first column for I1, I will use the second column for I2. And what do we have? We have a negative I1 minus 8, so we have negative 11. We have a negative negative I2, so that gives us a positive 3. And we've taken care of that, we've taken care of that, that. I'll move the 5 to the other side because I'm thinking standard form here. So we have a 5. Second one, okay, well we have a negative 3 I1, so that gives us a positive 3. We have negative 1, negative 3, so we have a negative 4. We have negative 10 plus 5, but then we move it to the other side, so we have 5 again. And there is our system of equations for solving this circuit. So what we get at the end of the day here is I1, I2. These are equal to negative 1 and negative 2 amps respectfully. Now again, the negative sign here, because we were consistent all the way through, the negative sign simply means that we chose the wrong direction for those mesh currents. In reality, they're going the opposite way. They're going counterclockwise. There we go. Right? They're going this way in both of the meshes. That's okay. We were consistent, so we know what those negative signs mean. The only thing that we have left to figure out, because this bottom branch does not share a side with any mesh, and this top branch doesn't share a side with any mesh, we now have solved for the current in those exterior branches. The only place that we still need to do a little bit of work is that middle branch, right? So let's go ahead and we'll find which direction or the value in the direction. So I will go ahead and say I1 minus I2. Okay. 
Okay. And what we have here is that would be equal to negative one minus negative two. And so that is equal to one amp. Okay. Notice that we have a positive value which means that the current in that branch that's shared between the two meshes is moving in the direction of mesh current I1. Okay. If we had decided instead to do I2 minus I1, okay, you would have ended up with a negative one amp, which means that whichever direction mesh current I2 is going, the current in the shared branch is going in the opposite direction. So I2 was going to the left. The negative sign means that the current in the shared branch is going to the right. So again, it doesn't matter if you do I1 minus I2 or I2 minus I1 the math will give you a negative sign for one of those two situations. So I just want you to be aware that doesn't matter which one you choose, but you just have to put your hat on when you end up with the negative sign. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, good. So that's one example problem. Let's go ahead and queue up a second example. Okay. So I've got another circuit set up here for you. Go ahead, see if you can apply the mesh current analysis to find the current in all of the branches. Got it? Good. All right, let's rock and roll. So the first thing that we should always ask ourselves is the number of meshes that are present. Meshes, it's always a good place to start. And here we see that there are three. So I'll go ahead. Um, uh, I guess I, I tend to just like going clockwise all the time and then deal with the negative signs as they appear. Uh, the other nice thing is that it right here, we see that we have a current supply that's going to the right on that top branch. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'll call, I'll go clockwise here. I'll call that mesh one. I'll call this mesh two, and I'll call this mesh, mesh three. Okay. Okay. Well, now we have identified our meshes. Now it's time for us to go ahead and apply KVL coupled with Ohm's law to get the currents in each of these meshes. Now, one of the things, the reason I chose this problem, one of the things that you notice right away is this current supply. What does that mean current I3 has to be equal to? Five, good, five amps. Because this branch is on the outside of the circuit. It's not shared between two adjacent meshes. You can immediately state that the current through the mesh current for three is five amps. It's the only thing it can possibly be. So that's always nice. It's always good to take advantage of that. So let's go ahead and apply mesh current for loop one. And again, We've chosen a direction. I'll start in the lower left-hand corner, and immediately I get a five volt drop. Keep walking. I have a drop of 38 ohms times current I1, and then I minus I3. You notice that this branch is shared between meshes one and three. So I need to minus five amps here keep walking and now I have this vertical branch which is shared between meshes one and two it's again a drop I have 30 and I1 minus I2 I keep walking along 
And finally, I have this 12 ohm resistor, which is not shared with any loop, excuse me, any mesh. And so it's just I1 there, and I get zero as the total. Sweet. How about two? Let's go through and do two. I'll start at node D. Walking along, the first thing I have is this 30 ohm resistor. And now since I'm walking in the direction of mesh current two, I am going to do I2 minus I1. Keep walking along, keep walking along. Now I see the six ohm resistor. And again, I'm walking in the direction of I2. And that six ohm resistor is shared between meshes two and three. So again, I have to have that minus five amps here for mesh three. Keep walking. Oh, I see a drop of 67 volts from this potential supply. Keep walking. And lastly, I have my 40 ohm resistor which is on the outside, the exterior of the circuit. And so it only involves current I2. Right? Well, now, again, we're in a situation where if we place this into standard form, we can invert the matrix and solve. So one last great hurrah. Uh, so let's go ahead. Uh, I have I138. I have minus 30, so that's negative 68 minus another 12. So I have a negative 80. I'll use the first column for I1, second column for I2. So I have a negative 80. I have negative 30 times negative I2, so that gives me a positive 30. It takes care of that. And then I have a negative 5 plus 5 times 38. So that's negative, that's 37 times 5, and I move it to the other side. So I have a negative 37 times 5. How about the bottom one? Okay, well, we have negative 30 I1, so that's positive 30. That's all I have. So I'll put positive 30. I have a negative 30 I2, negative 6 I2, so I'm negative 36 and a negative 40. So I have a negative 76. And then I need to take care of negative 6 times 5, so that's positive 30, minus 67, so I have negative 37, and then I move it to the other side. So I have a positive 37 here. So here is my augmented matrix that I need to invert in order to solve. Let's do that. What I have, making sure that I have the same labels, what I have at the end of the day is that the mesh current for one and two are equal to 2.5 amps and 0 0.5 amps. Okay, but wait, we're not done yet. Okay. We still need to find the currents flowing through each of the shared branches. So you could say, well, we're done with this 40 ohm branch. We're done with this 12 ohm branch because those are not shared. So we have those currents. And in fact, notice that we have positive signs. So through this 40 ohm resistor, we have current going to the left, and it's 0 0.5 amps. For this 12 ohm resistor, we have current going to the left, and it's 2.5 amps. And in fact, you can tell already, based on charge conservation, what the current must be through the 30 ohm resistor. Let's go ahead and find it. We'll do it with the mesh currents, but you already know what it should be. So through the 30 ohm resistor, it should be I1 minus I2. 
And if this ends up being positive, the current should be going in the direction of I1. And as you can see, 2.5 minus 0 0.5, we get 2 amps. So there should be 2 amps flowing down through that 30 ohm resistor. Yeah. Well, how about this 38 ohm resistor up here? Well, we'll say, okay, let's assume that it's in the direction of I1, and we have to subtract I3. This would be 2.5 minus 5 and negative 2.5 amps. In other words, it's flowing in the opposite direction of I1. That means that it must be going this way. We have 2.5 amps. Well, how about through the 6 ohm resistor? I will say I2 minus I3, just for kicks. And again, 0.5 minus 5 equals negative 4.5 amps. In other words, it's not flowing in the direction of I2. It's flowing in the opposite direction, meaning that it must be going this way. We have 4.5 amps. Pretty cool. If you're really curious, I like writing down the currents. It's always good as we're starting to learn to make sure that current conservation or charge conservation is still being obeyed. And indeed, we see that if we consider an individual node on this figure, we have 4.5 in, 2.5, and 2 out. Good. Everything's balanced. Or if we consider node D, we have 0.5 2.5 in, 2.5 out. So charge conservation, even though we didn't use Kirchhoff's current law explicitly, that charge conservation is still satisfied as we go through with our answer. Okay? We didn't actually employ KCL anywhere, but yet at the end of the day, KCL is being followed. Pretty cool. The last thing I'll, I'll give to you, and I said it's really hard for me to tell you which analysis technique to use. Okay? Sometimes you'll find that the fastest route forward is the most direct, KVL, KCL. Other times, mesh current might be a faster way to go. Or node voltage. Voltage. You can start to kind of get a sense as you're working through which one is sometimes more helpful. For example, mesh current is really helpful if there are a lot of exterior branches. Say, lots of exterior branches. Or lots of of current supplies, supplies. That would kind of be the situations, and I'll put lots of in quotes. And those would be the situations where mesh current might be a faster approach. For your node voltage, you could say lots of potential supplies, That might be one hint that node voltage would be good. Okay. Or a second one, you might say, well, yeah, Doug, Greg, um, few, I'll say few nodes, essential nodes. So to give you an idea, let's say for a moment, I'll give you an example of each. Let's say for a moment you have a potential supply, okay, and you have a bunch of resistors. You notice that this would be a real bugger to do with mesh current because we have 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven meshes, which means you'd have to solve a seven by seven matrix in order to get the appropriate values. Can be done, no problem. But you notice that if you applied node voltage, you only have two essential nodes, which means at the end of the day, instead of solving seven equations simultaneously with the mesh current, you'd only have to solve one equation using the node voltage. A different example, something different here. Let's, I'll use a potential supply right now. But this might be a situation where it's better to use something like put one there, put one right here. Actually, I'll take that out. Do it like this. Sorry, that's really ugly, but you get the you get the idea. This might be a situation where it's more advantageous to apply mesh current. As we look, we see that we have one, two, three, four, five nodes, five essential nodes. Whereas we have one, two, three, four mesh currents. So each way is going to have you solve, essentially each method you'll have to solve a system of four equations whether you do node voltage or mesh current. The advantage comes in is that when you're applying mesh current, you won't have to do any subsequent calculations for the current through any of those checkmarked resistors. Whereas if you did node voltage, you would still have to do some calculation after you have the potentials at the nodes. So this saves you having to do four back substitutions. It's minor, but, you know, I'm just trying to come up with some examples here. So that's just kind of something to chew on. And I would encourage you to start thinking about this. When you look at a circuit, one of the hardest things to figure out is which approach would be more beneficial, more time efficient. Both of them will get you to the right answer. Actually, all three of these will get you to the right answer. It's just a matter of, do I have to solve a seven by seven or do I just have to solve a single equation? Okay. So I'll leave you to chew on that. We'll work some more example problems in the next lecture. Thanks for your attention. I'll see you next time.